looking forward to the next uh, couple of hours with you because I've got some new material that I haven't really tried before. And uh, yeah, it's always nice to show you what I'm working on right now and then have you think about, well, how does it apply to your business? Uh, how you, can you customise this and, and have some steps forward in your business? This particular presentation, the first one that I'm going to go through, uh, I've, I've called How to Build a Business That Works Without You Without Having to Write a Single System Process or Checklist. Because uh, I know quite often times for a lot of business owners, this idea of systems and processes, uh, people make it like it, it's not a very sexy topic. It's not something that a business owner goes, yes, I want to sit down and document my processes and procedures. Um, so oftentimes that gets in the way and people come up with reasons and excuses as to why they can't systemise their business. Like there's so many different things people say, oh, if I write a system, my team isn't going to follow it anyway, or this particular task is too creative, it can't be documented, or I, I don't have time to document my systems and processes. Everybody has these reasons that bubble up about why they haven't actually done it. And I wrote that headline to, I suppose, capture your attention, but we're all business owners and you're here for a weekend about systems and processes, so you're probably under no illusion that it's hard work to build a business. It takes time, there's effort involved, and this presentation, it's not necessarily a, a, a holy grail as far as a magic button that I'm going to show you that you can press that'll create systems for you that are going to deposit large amounts of money into your bank account with very little or no work. Um, that said, though, I think what I want you to start thinking about is if you're working on things in your business that aren't scalable, that aren't duplicatable, if you're doing repetitive tasks, that's just dumb. A lot of business owners, they'll spend 80-hour work weeks just doing the same stuff over and over and over and over, and they never get enough separation from the business to be able to think strategically or, or work on their business, as Michael Gerber talks about, try and work on your business rather than in your business. And systems and processes are a way to extract that, and, and I think as you grow within business, you go through these different stages and different lessons and different insights will resonate more with you depending on where you are growing a business. And I'll take you through a framework to figure out where you are, which then makes it a little bit easier to think about, well, what are the next couple of steps do you need to get in place to kind of help you to move through that level to the next level? But I find a lot of people, they get stuck when it comes to the systems and processes. That seems to be where most business owners get stuck. They'll grow a business up to a certain size and then they feel like they're across everything. Like their hands are involved in invoicing, in getting clients, in delivery, in HR. In They're just across everything and that's kind of where they get stuck. And oftentimes a lot of the skills that you've picked up and learned that got you to the point that you are today or where you are right now in your business are actually the skills that hold you back from moving through to that next level because to grow the business up to one size, you do need to be across everything. You do have to micromanage. You're architecting this. You're, you don't have a team around you. So you do have to go out there and win as many new clients as you can and make sure that you manage their experience all the way through so they have a great experience and then they start to talk about you. And then you start to get referrals. So you, you do need to do that and you go all in up until a point. But then what ends up happening is it becomes a habit. And the business owner starts to feel like, well, this is just the way that things always are. And I followed these steps and it got me to here and I've reached a certain amount of success. So it becomes very hard to let go of those, to move through to that next level, to grow your business. You do have to step back. You do have to start to think about your business in terms of departments. You do have to assign responsibility to different team members. You don't think in terms of tasks. Like oftentimes a lot of business owners in those first couple of stages just think about assigning out tasks to their team members. Well, here's the 20 different things I need to get done. You go do that. As opposed to once you move through to that next level, you start to think more about responsibility. Okay, you are responsible, responsible for the accounts department and everything that happens with it. It's a, a subtle change, but it has big impact because then it enables you to delegate more effectively. It gets you to have your team members start to take ownership of the outcome. And really, that's what I want to take you through. I want to, at least in this first presentation, give you a few 
of the insights uh, that helped, that are counterintuitive, that's the other thing. Oftentimes, a lot of these things, you don't see it when you're in the thick of it. But having moved through now and, and uh, seen it from the other side, I want to show you three key um, counterintuitive lessons that should help you to move through to that next level. So what we'll end up covering this presentation, there are three main points that I want to cover. First, um, though, I would want you to figure out where you're at, uh, because particularly systems and processes are most relevant um, uh, at a particular point in business. Like I said, if it's just you, if you're in startup mode and you've got just one or two team members that you're working on, typically sp speaking, spending all your time on systems and processes and documenting things, uh, that gets in the way, like that's probably not the right time to be thinking about systems. But once you get up to a team of maybe seven to ten and beyond, then most definitely you need to start thinking about systems and processes. So, yeah, first up, I just want to give you a thinking framework to help you figure out where you are. Uh, then, then the three lessons that I want to go through. Firstly, we'll talk about, uh, and I phrased or I thought about each of these lessons that I wanted to give you to, to crush... Uh, sometimes a false belief that people have about systems and processes. So the first one we'll talk about is the systems creation hacking, how to get a team to build your processes for less than $10 an hour. Because the, the false belief that the business owner has is that they need to be one creating the systems and the processes. But that's a huge error in thinking, to think that the business owner needs to create that documentation. And I'll, I'll walk you through why and I'll give you a better way. Really, that's something that needs to be delegated to your team. Um, if you think about it this way, oftentimes if you, if you get yourself into a situation um, with a particular type of thinking, so all of the problems that you're having right now of being overwhelmed and working those 80-hour work weeks is because you're, yes, yes, give it all to me, I'll do it, I'll do everything. That got you into this situation. So when does it ever make sense to try and solve a problem from the same vantage point that got you into the situation? You, 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 the sooner we can start to delegate this, rather than having you go, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll write the systems and the documentation, the sooner we'll get it done. Because... You know, systems and processes, they're important, but they're not urgent, so they always get it delegated down in your, you know, or not delegated down, move down your priority list, and then oftentimes you don't get to them. We'll also talk about the 10 critical systems. There's, there's misconceptions around um, how many systems you need to have a significant impact in your business. Some people think that you might need, you know, hundreds of systems or processes before your business runs like a finely oiled machine, but... The Pareto principle applies here and there's 80-20. Like if we can identify just the handful of systems, which I think there's, in a lot of the businesses I've worked with, anywhere from 10 to 20 systems, getting those right will give you huge wins in efficiency and productivity uh, and it'll actually free you up to then give you space to start working on systems and processes. At some point, it is nice... Uh, for the business owner to get involved in the systems and processes, but not straight away. Like, you have to create enough space, otherwise you'll, you'll never get around to it. And then the final thing I want to talk about is this idea of swipe and deploy. How can you clone other proven systems and processes created by experts and then duplicate them in your business? Because if you think about business, what's business? The game of business is about solving problems. That's, that's really what you do as the business owner. You identify a problem, then you should try and find a system or a process that solves that problem, and then you deploy it in your business. And a lot of the problems that you're having, someone else has solved before. I mean, that's what Steve talks about in, in the academy and things like that. He's got the training. A lot of these problems that you're already having have been solved. So what we need to do is get a methodology for how do we identify what that problem is, how do we find who's got the solution, how do we then deploy that within your business, customise it and make it your own. And over time, what you're doing is you're building up the biggest, most valuable asset in your business, which is a database of systems that solve business problems. And regardless of what business you end up ever working in, this becomes your most valuable asset. Because oftentimes, a lot of the systems are directly transferable from one business to the next. My system and process for the way that I recruit 
uh, hire and get people on our team is, you know, by and large, probably going to work in just about every one of your businesses. You just need to customise it and tweak it. Really, where the main differences happen in systems and processes in a, in a business uh, is down at the operations level when it comes to the delivery of your products and services. But all the other stuff is actually very similar. HR, accounting, um, sales, marketing, a lot of this stuff you can actually uh, deploy in your business and model, model off what other people are doing. So they're, they're the things that I want to take you through. So we need to start off, obviously, uh, with, with where you are right now. So you'd have to agree that... Uh, Business is probably as easy as driving a car, isn't it? Upside down over a lake. That lake is on fire. And it's infested with crocodiles. <laughs> that's, that's what it can feel like. It's really just a matter of perspective, though. What systems thinking enables you to do is extract yourself from the situation and then start to look at things objectively. You'll start to learn that everything is a system. A system is just a, a set of steps, when taken, that create an outcome. And we're looking at optimising those steps to get a consistent outcome. And we want to get that documented so you can then have team members come in behind you, follow those steps and get that consistent outcome. So when you're in the thick of it and it feels like you're about to get eaten by a crocodile or burnt alive, if you approach it as this is just a problem with my systems and my processes, it, it actually, it, it's quite empowering because now it makes it easier to identify, well, this is just a problem. This is a problem with a system or a lack of a system or a process. How do I now fix that bit? And then you just play the game of identifying problems and finding systems and processes to fix them. So... This is the thinking model that I just wanted to start with first to kind of get you to think about, well, where are you now in this growth phase of what I call the four stages of entrepreneurship? Uh, because then that kind of helps you to understand what the breakthrough is. So there's four stages. There's the, the startup phase. There's the proven stage. There's the system stage and the complete stage. So when we go through this, that's the first thing I want you to think about is where am I? And you might have little elements of each. You might go, oh, yeah, I'm kind of crossing over from this stage or this stage or I haven't quite got that in place. The, the purpose of this is more of a little bit of a, th a thinking model for you. But that stage one entrepreneur, the startup entrepreneur, they've got loads of ideas. I know a entrepreneur oftentimes will have loads of ideas all the way through, but they're very scattered. They're, there's very little focus and they're very often opportunity seeking. You'll have lots of different things come up and oftentimes, you know, you might go to different seminars and workshops and jump from one thing to the next. And if you imagine the metaphor of this field and you're trying to dig for gold, all you've done is kind of dug two foot deep holes all across the field, but you've never gone really very deep on anything to try and actually find the gold. And there has to be a point where you start to focus. There has to be that point where you go, here is my product and service. Here is the target market that I'm serving. Here are the problems that they have, and I have products and services developed to solve their very specific problems. And you need to kind of let go of this um, FOMO, the fear of missing out, and think, well, there are all of these opportunities, millions of different ways to make money online, and try and stake your claim, find that one piece, and then go quite deep on that. Oftentimes as well, the, the person, when they're chasing uh, these different opportunities, they are they're going out trying to get work, and then when they get the work, then they do the work, and then they go out and chase to get more work once it's done, and they're just kind of doing the work, getting the work, doing the work, getting the work, jumping to different opportunities. And yeah, the real key leverage point here is focus. So if you find yourself in that situation, it's kind of maybe you need to just brain dump out all of the different opportunities that you've got into a notebook and then try and prioritise or think, well, which one has the, the best chance of success? And then double down on that one rather than kind of splitting yourself. I'm, I'm the same. I mean, I've been guilty of it. The reason I can talk about this so well is because I know what it feels like. Uh, I'm, for 
too long I've had too many different businesses. Melbourne SEO, Melbourne Video, System Hub, Planet 13. Um, Planet 13 was broken into different divisions. We had wholesale and retail and we were trying to franchise and just too much. You just need to focus in on one. Uh, oftentimes, if you can't make that one thing work with a lot of the information you've got, you've got the right environment by being here. If you can't make that one thing work uh, with focus, then what makes you think you're going to be able to get 100 things working? So, yeah, the real key for that first level. So the next level is, is the proven entrepreneur. So at this point, you've started to focus. You've started to think about... Who, are, who is my target market? I know who my target market is. I know what problems they've got. I know very deeply and intimately about their situation. And at this point, you're, you've got leads coming into you. Like you're starting to get some word of mouth. You're starting to get a little bit of results, but you're very much across everything. You're, you are handling the marketing, the sales, the finance. I mean, you're doing everything. Yes, you're focused, but you're still across everything. Oftentimes, uh, effectively, what you're doing at stage two is swapping um, time for money. Like, that's, that's really what you're doing. You don't have any replicable way of making profit because really it's just you. you you'll get the client. You're still centred to, to everything. You might have a team around you. You know, it's usually less than about seven. Maybe it's a few contractors. It's a part-timer. You know, you find someone on Upwork or Odesk or whatever uh, and you're working with them. Uh, at this point as well, oftentimes the proven entrepreneur, they're just focusing on gross uh, as in how much am I selling? That's, that's the number one thing. And they, they think, well, all I've got to do to break through to that next level is sell more. But that's, that's probably not where they should be focusing on. For me, at this stage too, it's really about um, building that proof as far as trying to get the outcome that you're promising your target market and delivering that to numerous people, having them realise that, yes, I've got great value from you, trying to document that proof, case studies, photos, all that sort of stuff to prove that, yes, the model that I've got, Michael Gerber talks about it as the, the franchise prototype, you, you want to collect that proof to know that this is going to work. Uh, and you also want to focus on, at this point, starting to get your your lead flow. Like that's kind of how you start to break through that next level. You'll be getting lead flow through word of mouth and things like that. But if you can kind of start to automate that, it helps you to move through to that, that next level. At this point for the stage three, the systems entrepreneur, you've got good lead flow now. Like you, you've proven yourself. People are starting to talk. You've got a level of authority. Um, for those of you who came to the presentation that I did last time at this particular event was the authority content. Um, that really fits into potentially stage two because it's all about building up that authority so people start to go, ah, oh, I want to work with that person and it's about positioning because you, you don't want to have necessarily a discussion about price when your lead comes to you. You want, to, want them to think, well, does your products and services solve a problem that I've got? Fantastic. Okay, I'll work with you and it's less about price because you've positioned yourself as that expert and authority. Um, in this next phase, uh, oftentimes as you see people cross over, and this is where a lot of people get stuck, is you know, they've got the big long list of to-do items of things that need to be done. They're, uh, they're really spinning plates. Like they've got leads and customers coming in, um, but it almost feels like you know, they've got two or three you know, team members or seven team members around them. They give this person a little bit of work. They move to the next one, spin the next plate, give this team member some work. Move to the next one, spin this plate, give this team member some work. Keep going all the way along to the team members. They haven't yet got to any point of doing their own work. And then they realise, oh, I've got to jump back and start spinning this plate again. I've got to keep this team member going. I've got to keep this team member going. And they don't really get much of their own work done because they're just, they're stuck. And this is where, like I said, that's where so many entrepreneurs stick. That, that, that's a real sticking point. It just feels like more often than not, they're putting out fires. And the counterintuitive thought or, or the thought that people have is they just think, you know what they think at this point the answer to their problems are? They think, if I just get another staff member, 
It'll ease some of the load. I'll be able to pass some of the work over to them and everything will be easy. Like that's, that's the feeling that you get and you think that's going to help you. So you try and sell a little bit more to try and get another staff member in. But you're already busy spinning all of these plates. Some people that are really effective spinning plates sometimes get up to 10 staff. And they're jumping around like absolute mad people and they're still working 60, 70 hour weeks. The, the breakthrough here, it's, it's not about hiring more staff and that's why it's a little bit counterintuitive. This is where you need to really get systems in place and start to document things so things start to happen in your business that don't rely on you. And again, the, the reason this is so hard for people to cross over is because systems and processes are, are important, but they're not urgent. What do you think, when the client picks up the phone and says, where is my product or service? Or another person, a lead, picks up the phone and calls you and says, um, you know, I want to buy your products and services. Of course, that's going to take priority. You're not going to sit down and try and document your processes and your procedures when you've got these other things going on. That's why you never get around to doing systems and processes. But you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place now because the, the reason you can't create that space is because you don't have systems and processes and you're not getting that space to be able to create them because you're so full. So the problem, that's causing the problem. So that, that's, again, why so pe many people in the next few slides I've got will kind of help you to think about, well, how do you break through that little piece? Uh, one of the real secrets of this stage, once you get the systems and the processes in place, is to go on holiday. Because when you go on holiday, your team has to work without you. One other thing I found was really interesting, and this is that thing uh, Michael Gerber talks about, um, you know, it's the technician that starts the business owner, like the, uh, well, starts the business. Oftentimes, someone's working for someone else. It's the hairdresser or the mechanic, and they're working for them for a little while, and they think, why am I working for this guy? I could go start up my own shop over here. I'm an expert mechanic. I, I should be able to do that. So they go start the business up over here, and they very quickly learn there's it's a very different skill between the doing of the work and the actual running of the business. So, and they, they, they get stuck. And for me, I got stuck at this level for so long, particularly with Melbourne SEO, that company there, because I started up and I was the lead SEO. I was spearheading the work that we were doing. I was out there figuring it out. Um, and I was putting the content out. So when people came to Melbourne SEO and video, they were asking for me. And they had technical questions that I needed to answer. W when we set up Melbourne Video Production, which was another business, I didn't know how to use a camera. So I couldn't hop on the tools. So it was actually a blessing in disguise. I look back now, the best thing you can do just about is to have a business where you can't deliver the operations because then you have to systemize it. You have to make sure that your numbers stack up, that you can go out and employ someone else to do the task, because you don't know how to do the task. So that's, yeah, another real reason people get stuck at this level is because they're doing the doing, whereas at least if you go away on holiday, that forces the team to step up and also gives you a chance to figure out, well, what breaks? What's the first thing that breaks when I'm not around? Get the core systems and processes in place, go away on holidays for two weeks, come back and then see what didn't get done. Okay, well, there's where we need to start focusing on some systems and processes. And then the final stage, um, which this presentation isn't necessarily about, but it's kind of, you kind of need it to understand the full picture, um, is the complete, what I call the complete, complete entrepreneur. It's where the business runs without you. It's through your systems and your processes, it passively creates money for you. You have an operations manner. You, you have a CEO who's running your business and you're more of the strategic advisor. You're getting them to deliver KPIs to you. You see business really as a collection of systems and processes uh, and, and you can become more of the architect of that. And what you do is, in the complete uh, entrepreneur level, is you can very quickly, it's almost like the matrix. You know, when you start seeing in the matrix, you can't not see in the matrix. Um, 
in business, you'll just start to identify well, where are the problems, and you go, oh, that's a systems. If it's a systems problem, here's the system that I need to deploy, and, and you start to build up these collections of systems. And at this stage, the big payoff comes. It's not from in stages one, two, and three. You're getting paid a wage. It's effectively you're getting time for dollars. Whereas as a stage for entrepreneur, the big payday comes when you're buying and selling business. Like it's the capital event of selling the business. It's not exchanging time for dollars. It's the sale and, and buying of assets that makes you the money. Um, to, to really move through this level, that's, you know, you, you, you hire CEOs and um, you have different department heads who, who run the operations. Again, probably not where we need to focus on at the moment, but just to get a little bit of an idea of where people see where they're at. And like I said, you can have a little bit of a foot in each of the different camps um, and you will exhibit some lessons, but just to get an idea, who is at the startup phase? Yep, so there's a few startups. And have you got some insight or some lessons, one, to identify where you are, but also two, maybe what to focus on to help you move through to that next level. And hopefully over this weekend, you'll start to figure out which sessions resonate with you more. And another thing is you need to start learning almost like just-in-time learning. When you're just getting started, a lot of people feel like they have to learn everything just so they kind of understand what's going on. Uh, and, and, you know, you'll join something like the, the Academy and there's so much information in there, it can be overwhelming. To break through to that next level, think about, well, what is the problem I'm having right now? Find the piece of information that solves that problem and just learn that piece. Quit trying to feel like you have to be across everything. Like you have to be in the moment and solve that problem. So, and then level two, the proven entrepreneur. Yep. Okay, so we've just got one proven entrepreneur. So that's kind of when you, you've now got something that you're, you've focused in on the business and you're... Um, you've, you're starting to collect some runs on the board. At least you've got that focus now, and hopefully you've got just a few insights now on what you should collect, um, connect. If you go ahead and email me, dave at systemhub.com, I'll give you a free copy of... This is just for this lady here, because that's the information she needs now. I'll give you a free copy of authority content, because that's really what you need to do at that stage. You just need to build yourself up as the authority and the expert in the space. Uh, who's at this level three? Okay, so probably a little bit more established businesses. You kind of know, you're kind of spinning all of those plates, you're jumping around, and that's really what this presentation is about. Uh, and I'm going to show you how to kind of break through on that, and it's the reason I also wanted to do this, the information that I'm about to share with you at the moment, or in a second to do with systems and processes, it'll help everybody. It's nice to go in, but it's most relevant for those people. Like the people who just said, I'm a, you know, at this stage three, the information that I'll give you, these counterintuitive lessons are going to be very, very helpful because they're solving the problem that you've got right now. And then stage four, any stage fours in here? Yep. Perfect. So, and that's kind of when you, you, you start to think about business separately um, or, or as little separate entities. So, yeah, this particular session, it's, it's really for someone who's been in business usually a few years. Um, they're very clear on the target market. They know the problems that they're solving. They've already got a, a good amount of te um, a team around them supporting them. Uh, and, and we can kind of look at breaking through to that next level. So, I think no presentation around systems and processes can be complete without quoting Michael Gerber. Um, I think one thing is, uh, Michael has, I mean, you may have seen this quote, if your business depends on you, you don't have a business, you have a job, and it's the worst job in the world because you're working for a lunatic, as in you're working for yourself. <laughs> So that's, uh, yeah, an important insight to think if it re relies on you, you don't really have a business. It, the, the business needs to operate without you. It, it has to. Like, that's effectively what we're building. That is the asset value as well. When it comes to actually selling the business, what does the potential buyer look at? What does the uh, level four complete entrepreneur look at? He wants to make sure if he purchases that business from you, that that business will continue to operate after he, you, he buys it from you. Like, if the business is centred around you, what has he got? He can't really buy anything. He's, he is buying the most valuable asset you've got is the systems and the processes. That's what McDonald's is selling. They're, they're selling a system and a process. Some people, if you ask them, what's the most valuable asset in a business? Some people, especially if they're marketers, they'll go, the list. The list is the most important asset in the business. But if that were the case, you'd think, 
McDonald's would probably sell you a list of customers, a database. No, they, they sell you, here's how we run the business. That's, that's where the asset value is. And if you've tried systems and processes in the past uh, and you haven't got it to work, you know, you've, you've kind of dabbled around the edges and you've come to the conclusion that thinking systems and processes aren't for you, then we need to throw those out the window. I mean, every business needs to crack this nut. And I think a lot of the information out there, uh, a lot of it's actually outdated with systems and processes. That's why I quite like what Steve's doing with this particular event to get more updated information. Some of it is useful, uh, some of it is useful but incomplete, some of it is outdated. So the idea of systems and processes as we previously knew them, you know, these big fat phone books that sit on a um, folder on a bookshelf that no one actually refers to, you know, that's, that's not what we're talking about. We're going to try and break some of these patterns. Um, and, and what I want to do is try and give you an epiphany through this to go, ah, Systems are the most important asset. It is a bridge that every business owner needs to cross. That's the other key thing to have. Like, you have to cross this bridge. And I want to teach you a, a new way of thinking, a new philosophy. Um, I call it systemology, and that's what I'm going to walk you through. Just to make sure that we're all talking the same language, though. I mean, when I talk about systems, I mean, systems, processes, procedures, checklists, standard operating procedures, like, for me, that's all the same thing. A system, I'm just talking about a series of steps that, when followed, create a consistent outcome. And, and you need to build a collection of those. That's all business is. It's a collection of systems and how they integrate and uh, connect with each other. So is this, uh, yeah, making sense? Yep. Cool. So there was a big breakthrough for, for me a little while ago um, when I finally removed myself from the day-to-day -day operations of Melbourne SEO and video. Um, that was last year. Uh, it took me 10 years in that business. I've been in business a long time, uh, and I just got stuck in that holding pattern. Uh, and it wasn't until I got a CEO in there, she now runs the day-to-day -day operations, and I've removed myself that I can finally feel myself as a business owner. And anyone who's been in business will, <laughs> will know um, that's not a small feat. Like, that, that's hard, hard work. There's no two ways about it. Um, but... but We've had a lot of different wins over the sort of time. That was definitely a big one. But for me, just recently, I got to speak on stage at a TEDx in the Netherlands and talk to some kids around systems thinking um, as a philosophy. So w what we also talk about will extend far beyond business. I had the epiphany um, of systems thinking related to business, but, but it extends well beyond that. And now I'm, I'm sold on this idea. This is just the way that I see the world. Uh, I'm a systems nut and... I'm hoping this ends up being really contagious for you. because This, this is the master skill of the entrepreneur. It, it is the building of systems. There's, there's no two ways about it. Um, obviously, it wasn't always that way. The, the way I broke through was, um, for me, if I just go back a few short years uh, before Melissa kind of took over, very much working 24-7 like most business owners, just really focused in on the business to the exclusion of all else. Um, probably friends and family thought I was a little bit crazy with the amount of hours that I was putting in and they're kind of, you know, you need better work-life balance and all, all that sort of thing. Um, and and I, I knew I wanted that, but then I, I had this deadline, nothing like a deadline to make things happen. So that's, if there's anything that you can do to take away... Uh, from this particular presentation, if you can build in deadlines into the way that you work, like something has to be done by a certain date, that's when it gets done. So the, the deadline that I had was, uh, this was my first year, so this is Nathaniel, it's going back a couple of years now, two and a half years, um, but when we fell pregnant, I, I said to myself, I don't want to be that business owner uh, or that person, that dad, who's too busy to hang out with their kids, too busy to go to the sports game, too busy to take time off over school holidays. Like, I had seen that, particularly from my dad, always too busy, always on the phone, always doing something, and I thought, that's not the way that I, I want to be. So I had this deadline, and I thought, right, I need to figure this out, and I was a little bit embarrassed at that point. Yes, Melbourne SEO and video had been running for a good seven years or something like that, uh, but I still was embarrassed because 
I didn't really have a business. Like, it, it, everything would grind to a halt if I wasn't working. So that's why I kind of thought, right, I have to do something about this. I, I needed to find the way. Um, and I, I kind of went on that search and gave myself that nine-month deadline. And I started to look through my past history of the different businesses that I was involved in to try and figure it out. And I, I knew, I, I don't know if it was my financial background or um, I was involved in this this. Uh, rock and roll clothing music store. We set it up like a franchise, and we we actually got it up to three staff. We uh, sorry, three stores, 25 staff, retail vision, wholesale division, and I, I recognised the most valuable asset that we were selling in that business was how we were actually running the store. So I I knew all of this system stuff. I'd heard it before. You know, I'd read the E Myth, built to sell, worked the system, all that sort of stuff. I I knew this was important. Yet, why was it in my digital agency? Wasn't I applying it? I was coming up with all these excuses. You know, the biggest one I had in um, the digital agency? I said, yeah, well, I'm dealing with Google here, and Google changes their algorithm up. You know, they're always rolling out different algorithm updates and things like that. Uh, so, even if I write a system, it's going to get outdated. So there's no real point in me writing systems for that. Like, why, why would I do something if it's going to get outdated? And then I started coming up with these other excuses, like I don't have time, I, this and that. And that's really what kept me stuck. It was all of those excuses. But, but I, I knew that, you know, we, we, we'd done it before. We did it at Melbourne... Oh, sorry, we did it at Planet 13. So... I thought, I, I need to figure out what's going on here. Why, why am I not doing it? And, and like I said, I started reading all of those books. I'd already read them before. Um, and then I realised there was no system for systemising business. And, and if you'd followed work that I've been doing for a little while with System Hub, I talk about the system for creating systems, which I'll give you a little bit later. But that's just a, a piece of the puzzle. What, what is the actual system for creating, like systemising business? You, you read the e-myth and there's no step-by-step formula. There's no step one, do this, step two, do that. Uh, and that's what, what I'm going to share with you actually in the second part of the presentation. Um, but I, I persisted because I knew systems and processes the way and inch by inch I started to, I was putting one system in at a time and things, we did start to get some wins. Things started to happen without me. It, as you'll learn in a little bit, I'll, I'll show you that me doing that process was actually holding me back. That's one of the worst things that you can do if, if the business owner is doing it. But I did it piece by piece. We started to systemise things. And then the final piece of the puzzle really was for me to completely step out. I, we took a couple of different holidays. Like holidays were actually um, quite valuable to the business in identifying those holes. And then the final piece was to get uh, Melissa to step in and run it. We hired the CEO and now that's kind of enabled me to free up and focus on, on what I'm focusing on now, which is System Hub. So no matter what business you're in, I don't care. Systems are the most important foundation. I, I think, yeah, whether you're a digital agency, plumber, broker, baker, healthcare a person, this, this guy actually runs a business um, helping ex-police officers, oh, sorry, helping police officers. He is an ex-police officer and he helps people uh, get jobs in the police force because it's quite a, a rigorous process. I worked with him um, to extract him out in the day-to-day -day operations of his business. The only reason I, I mention that is really I just want you to suspend the belief. You know that little voice, the, the monster in your head, and I keep on going over and over because it's a hard one for me to squash. Yeah, but my business is different. Like That happens so often. You need to squash that. That is, uh, yeah, you, you, the only way is to systemise. Anyway, I've harped on long enough about that. I'm, I'm hoping that you... you for the right person who hears that message, it'll have a big impact. So let's talk about the three things, uh, the breakthroughs that I wanted to share with you. So firstly, we'll, we'll talk about uh, systems creation hacking, how to get your team to build systems and processes for less than $10 an hour. And this, as I mentioned, this, this is to crush the belief that the business owner needs to do it, okay? That's the purpose I've put this one together. So. This guy taught me this lesson. Um, his name's Nick Thakralal, good friend, known him for a long time. Runs a um, cool software uh, called Leads Hook. And I was sharing with him when I was in Melbourne SEO and Video um, the frustration I was having around systemizing Melbourne SEO and Video. And, and he said something, I mean, he says things quite just nonchalantly, just kind of throws it out there, and oftentimes they're just little nuggets of gold. He said, why don't you hire the consultant 
uh, who knows how to do that particular system or the process, pay them to develop the system and, and the process that you can then deploy in, in your business. The yeah, but monster popped up in my head and said, yeah, but I don't have $10,000 to pay some overpriced consultant who's going to help me document what we're already doing. So that, that, but, but what it did do, it, it planted a seed in my head, which is, well, what if I don't have to be the person doing it? What if I, I could delegate this to someone else? And that stayed with me, and um, obviously at that point, I'd kind of started to free myself quite a bit from Melbourne SEO by doing it myself. But as I've started to work with business owners to try and help them systemize, I work with this guy, Tim Reed. Does anyone, has anyone heard of him, Tim Reed? He runs a podcast called Small Business Big Marketing. Um, it's actually Australia's number one podcast on small business marketing, and you guys don't know it, but <laughs> that's awesome. Um, Oh, well, I have to let, let him know his marketing's not very good. <laughs> um, but he, he is a self-confessed systems dunce. Like he, he's a big picture guy. He, he doesn't like to get down into the details of systems and processes. Um, when he gets his head down there, it just infuriates him and, and frustrates him. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. I've known him for years. We've uh, he was the MC at my wedding. We've done some travelling together and. Um, been in different masterminds together and we've had this conversation numerous times. Hey, Tim, you've got to systemize yourself. Like he runs a podcast and the process of running a podcast every single month, it's the same. Like or every single week I think he puts out a podcast. Like that's, that is a system and a process. But he was kind of doing everything. So I said to him, look, if it's up to you, it's not going to get done. So how, how can we work our way around this? And he introduced me to a guy called David Warren, who he interviewed on his podcast, Small Business, Big Marketing. Uh, and this guy ran a company called, it was a tall ships company. Um, they sailed those boats around Sydney Harbour. Um, and it was on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, he'd kind of grown it up to a certain size, but had a huge amount of tax debt, uh, was very much str struggling, uh, went on a, one of those tours to go visit Manila, you know, go to the different BPOs, business process outsourcing companies, um, recognised the opportunity, uh, moved all of his back end, like back office staff over to the Philippines, systemised his business, saved the business, uh, then went on to sell that business, which was almost on the verge of bankruptcy, and then set up a business process outsourcing company helping people overseas because he was, you know, sold on the idea. Um, you can probably see where this is going. So Tim, we, we kind of recognised that Tim was going to be the, the worst person to, to do it. So uh, Tim uh, introduced me to David. David assigned a virtual assistant to work on Tim's account. His name is Joel. Um, and uh, I was working with Joel. And we went through this process of just getting Tim to screen record everything that he was doing. Like that was, he would just load up Camtasia or, I mean, Snagit, there's ton, Jing, Loom, there's loads of different software on, on the recording, but he would record the task getting done, he would load it into um, System Hub or, I mean, you could use Dropbox or YouTube or whatever, would leave the video in there, he gave him the system for creating systems, which I'll give you in a moment, and then said to his VA, I want you to watch this video, follow the system for creating systems, and I want you to document this process. So that was kind of like step one. The team member, Joel, went through and documented all of the core processes, and because he documented all of the core processes, he kind of understood what was going on. So he's able to start taking work off Tim's plate now because he was involved in the creation. Now, I don't always recommend it that way, depending on the size of bi the business. Like, Tim really only had a couple of different contractors that he was working with, and he was kind of doing everything. So it just made sense for him to record it as he was doing it and then made that the last time. But for some business owners that are more established, uh, sometimes it makes more sense to figure out who in the business is doing that task and get them to record it. But it's still the same process. You, you identify what, what is the problem that we're trying to fix here. Uh, you then uh, figure out who in the organisation is currently doing that or can do that figure out a method of extraction. So how are you actually going to record it happening? Uh, and then you want to load that into like a central place where you can organise it. And then you have a team member go through and do the documentation for you. 
So following system for systems, you get them to pick out the main bullet points. That becomes version one of the document. Then you get other team members to review it when they do the task. And then this library of documentation ends up getting built out. So we docu like Tim's got a more than a seven-figure business. He does very well for himself. Um, and we documented it using a Philippines-based assistant um, for you know, $10 an hour through a business process outsourcing company. He didn't have to hire some overpriced consultant. He just documented what he was doing. Um, that's the other thing when it comes to systems. Systems, at the best of times, is often hard to do. So if you can keep it simple, like simple work, simple scales. Anytime you overcomplicate things, that will just get in the way of doing it, particularly with staff members. Friction is the enemy of systems. You need to make things as easy for you to capture and get it in and delegate it and assign it. And then if you, you can scribble that URL down, systemhub.com forward slash template SOP. We'll go through that a little bit later so you can see it, but that's where you can go and actually download it. Um, and all it is, it's, it's a document that you give to a staff member that says, here's the way that we document. And it says, you know, figure out what problem you're trying to solve, figure out who's going to um, solve that problem. Um, then you need to pick a time with them to book in the actual recording, figure out how you're going to capture it. Sometimes it's screen recording. Sometimes it might be a, a live handy cam. Sometimes it's an audio dictation. you just got to figure out what is the easiest, least friction way to capture what is actually getting done. And then how do they listen to it? How do they pull out the main steps? How should you format it so things are consistent? Like That's all the system for um, creating systems is. So I, I did want to show you, you can either go through a business outsourcing company or you can go to somewhere, somewhere like Upwork. And I'll just show you something like Upwork. Has anyone used Upwork before? Yeah, good number of people. Um, okay, so what I'm just going to do, uh, I'm going to come up here. So Upwork is just like a freelancing website. You can go there and recruit people from all around the world. It's kind of like a reverse eBay. Uh, rather than seeing a product and you putting a bid on it, you go there and you say, well, here's my job that I want you to do. And then other people bid on your job and say, I'll do it for $5. I'll do it for $20. I'll do it for $50. So it's, it's just uh, a place. And, and uh, you can get staff every, everywhere. But what I love about it most is the, the ability to filter. So if I come up here and I go find freelancer and let's do um, uh, systems documentation. Just run this. Now I go filters and if you want you can write these filters down. Um, I like to make sure that someone's at least earned a grand on the platform so that way I know, you know they've done some work. I want to make sure that they've got job success of up to 90%. So I want to make sure the feedback they've got is really, really good. Like, I don't want to work with someone who's got average reviews. I get the ability to filter, so why not? This particular task, I mean, documentation, it's a $10 an hour task, $10. I want to make sure that someone has got at least 100 hours built on Upwork, because I don't want to work with someone who's just getting started and they haven't yet... Um, you know, got enough runs on the board. Yes, you might find someone good in there, but I'd like to stack the odds in my favour and increase the likelihood that this person's going to be good. Come down here. We want to do documentation, so I want them to be with fluent with English. I want, you know, they, they don't have to be uh, writing novels or anything like that, but I, I want to make sure that they're fluent. Um, and then... We want an independent contractor. I don't really like going through those freelance, like the agencies, because usually then you chat with one person, you don't actually really get control over the individual that you're working with, so the reviews don't really matter because you're getting the reviews for the entire organisation, not for the individual. And then I usually like someone who's worked over the last month. So now I've filtered this process down. Um, what do we got now? Does it say how many? Okay, about 60 applicants. Uh, let's see if we can find... Someone here, business analyst, customer service, SEO. Um, sometimes, depending on what they are, someone like this, if they've got a good variety of tasks, I often find that's a good person to work with because systems documentation, you kind of have to understand, you know, have a more of a generalist, you're not a specialist. Um, so she, she could be quite good. She's in Bangladesh. One other filter I like to do, actually. I've had very good success um, hiring in uh, Southeast Asia. 
So let's do Asia, Southeast Asia. Cool. All right. Um, yep. Potentially project managers tend to do quite well because they're quite good at, at um, thinking through where people get stuck. So there you go. Ten dollars based in the Philippines. I love recruiting out of the Philippines. Ten dollars an hour. Um, Ninety-six percent job rate. I mean, you could click on her, find out a little bit more. Virtual assistant, project management coordination. I think she she potentially could be a great person for that role. So anyway, long story short, I just want to kind of show you how and where you can find these people who can actually do the documentation through Upwork. Um, so there was just the filters. I'll chat with Steve about getting him a copy of the slides. Question? Uh, good question. Um, so all I did was identify the person. The other piece of the puzzle is you need to actually write what the job is that you want them to do. You need to post it, and then you would invite them into that job, and then you can actually pick... Um, uh, you can have jobs based on, I only want to spend this amount to get it done, or you can also have them log X number of hours, but you cap the number of hours. So there's a whole bunch of different ways you can do the pricing. Uh, they can, yep. I mean, you, if you want, you, you can position it that way. Um, one of the best ways to recruit, if you're looking for someone to do this for you long term, think about a really small trial task uh, bid that job out to three different people. Find three people, invite them, just your first one, have them all do the same task, and one of them is going to float to the top like a rock star. And then you work with them long term. Like that's, that's a really great way to recruit. And, you know, if it's a $10 an hour job, spending 50 bucks on each person to, to test them out, that's probably the best 50 bucks you could spend. Um, so this first one, uh, and I know that the, the timing... Uh, uh, yeah, this this particular first one, the person who says, I don't have time for this, that's hopefully that helps to crush that. I'm kind of showing you how you can get someone else to do it. Record what you're doing or get someone else in your business at the different departments to record what they're doing, get it into central place, find someone else to do the documentation version one. Next time the person does the task, they can read through the documentation and make sure nothing's missing. And then the final step would be to actually get that person to teach someone else because you, you always want redundancy in your business. You always want two people who can do a task rather than just having it uh, in on the one. So that's um, that, that first one. Did that kind of give some good insights? Yep. Cool. All right. So the next one we need to look at is the uh, 10 uh, crucial systems or 10 critical systems. This helps to crush the belief that you need hundreds of different systems uh, within your business to make it run smoothly. With all of the different businesses I've worked with, oftentimes there's only 10 or 15 systems. If you get those done first, will will give you huge wins, make you feel like, yes, I can see systems thinking is the way forward, and then you'll double down on this because you'll realise this is where you should be spending your time. I, I learnt this through a guy uh, called Mike Rhodes. Does anyone know Mike Rhodes? Yep. No? Okay, so Mike Rhodes, um, he runs a... Uh, I'll have to let Mike know that as well. Um, his marketing isn't working. He, he, um, the, he wrote the uh, Definitive Guide. He was a co-author with uh, Perry Marshall, and they wrote the Definitive Guide to AdWords. He runs an AdWords agency out of Melbourne. Um, he's considered by many kind of in that top 10 of best AdWord experts in the world. And... Uh, he was sold on the idea of systems because one of his very first businesses uh, was in New Zealand and it was an internet cafe and he, uh, he built it up, he got all the documentation in place and then sold that business. And the person who bought that business bought that business on the idea that it was systemized and it wouldn't like it'd work without Mike. So that's how he managed to sell that, that business. He's a, an ex emith coach as well, like going back... 13 years ago or something like that when Michael was just getting all of his e-myth coaching going. He was one of the very first e-myth coaches. So he's very much a, a true believer. And it was funny, when we, we shared an office in Melbourne for a little while and I, I, I saw this as well, like he was a true believer of systems and processes, but he, for a little while there, was also stuck in that idea that, um, you know, oh yeah, I work in an agency, Google moves so quickly, things change, I can't really get systems and processes in place. Uh, but then he finally thought, no, nah, I'm going to do this and double down on this idea of systems and processes. So he started documenting everything. 
probably over the course of about six to 12 months, he created 300 systems. It was a beautiful thing. He created this A3 bit of paper. It was like the index page, and it listed out all of the different systems, and he stuck it to the wall. Do you know what happened? Correct. No one ended up using it. Like, he put all this effort into it, but it was too clunky for people to find what they wanted when they needed it. There were too many. Like, oh, how do I actually choose? And because he documented everything down to the minute detail and had screenshots, when someone actually used the system, the interface was outdated anyway. So he was like, ah, oh, that was annoying. That was, you know, a 12-month lesson in, in uh, systemization. But the good thing is, I, through that process, I got the lesson that you actually need far fewer systems than you think. And it's also important that you don't over-document the systems. Like if you have good systems to hire good people, your systems don't need to be down to McDonald's level where you can you know, hire a 15-year-old kid to come in and run it because you kind of have this exact system. If you hire smart people and you've got the main core bits, like excellent people can make good systems. Like when you pair those together, you get an excellent outcome. So, yeah, he, I'll show you how we can identify those few game-changing systems. So, the, I worked with this guy here, Simon Kelly, and uh, I got connected through him through a guy called Troy Dean. He runs uh, an, a community called WP Elevation, uh, and it helps WordPress consultants or agents become better at what they do. Anyway, so we, we've talked with Simon about um, systemizing his business, and I, I wanted to understand you know, how his business worked so we could identify the 10 or 15 systems that were going to have the biggest impact. So we kind of went through this process of going, okay, where do you get the traffic to your website from? What are the different marketing sources you've got? Okay, once they get to the website, what do they actually do? Like, how, what are the call to actions? Do you get them to pick up the phone? Do you get them to email an inquiry? Okay, then what happens after that? Um, after they've made a, a, an inquiry, um, do you... He has a thing called a scorecard where he... Um, calculates how valuable a lead is based on this scorecard, and then he determines whether or not he sends out a proposal. Then what happens after the proposal? Well, then he gets them to uh, accept, and then what happens? Okay, then they get invoiced, and then they got onboarded. So we basically tried to map out his business in a flow like this. Like, what happens first? What happens next? Like, simple stuff and made sure it was core focus. Because this happened with Tim Reed as well. When he first started and I was working with his VA, he bought some home study course on um, how to do Instagram marketing and all this sort of stuff. And he wanted his VA to do this and that. He was throwing different courses at him. And I was like, Tim, we haven't even documented your core deliverable of you run a podcast. Let's just systemize that. And then we'll come back, look at all of these other courses and go, well, how do we plug where do these systems fit into your core deliverable? How can that make the core deliverable better? So you just got to focus on your core first. And we mapped out something like this. Um, now, the other thing we had as well, I chatted with him and he said, well, at the moment my problem is I've already got enough leads. I'm getting referrals, so I don't really need to worry about that. The problem I'm having is actually in the delivery so we said, okay, well, for now, let's not worry about the lead generation system. Let's jump straight to the scorecard. Let's jump to, then he schedules a meeting. Then he sends out a proposal. Then he follows up with them. There's some sort of handover and invoicing, client um, onboarding, uh, setting up the project in his project management tool, sending out the client updates, and then delivery. O obviously, certain things when it comes to particularly delivery, like operations, there could be a whole bunch of systems and processes under there. But a lot of these other ones are just one little standalone system or process. What is the process for creating a proposal? Okay, well, let's work on that. Like, I mean, just by doing this, you figure out, well, what are the 9, 10, 15 systems that, when you work on those, are going to have the biggest impact? So that's what we identified first, and, and then um, he, he was quite lucky. He had one of those deadlines in place. He was going away to China in two weeks' time, so we mapped out this. He had some virtual assistants that he works with. Um, he... Once he identified this, he uh, screen recorded what he could, handed it over to the VA, they went through the documentation, he sent it off to them and he got the guts of his core systems in place. Then he went away on holidays for two weeks and guess what happened when he went away on holidays to his business? 
just kind of just chugged away, didn't burn to the ground. He came back and it was still operating. Yes, things lagged and yes, things dropped and things got stuck, but that was just a great opportunity for him to go, okay, well, I have to get a system in place for that next time. So then he started working on his next wave of systems. So you just got to break it down into your core and then you start plugging the holes and then you, yeah, over time you start to develop this database and he, he became a real true believer at that point of systems. Like he could, he could see the way forward that business is just simply a collection of systems. Um, he got a little bit more fancy. That's very small. So I made it a little bit bigger for you, but it's probably a little bit too small anyway. Uh, I've broken this into two halves, but he got a little bit more fancy. He started breaking up the different departments in his business and then started to talk about, okay, well, lead generation. He wanted to do these fancy flow charts. I mean, you'll see my fancy flow charts in a little bit. They just look like circles on a page. Um, but, but he, you know, started doing these triangles, which are decision boxes. I mean, you can take it up a couple of levels, but for me, it's always about simplicity. Systems is about simplicity. You just want the team member to look at it and get it and be able to apply it. Um, but yeah, he started mapping this out. And then by doing this, uh, if it will change to the next slide, um, oh. uh, yeah, then it kind of goes into that next process, uh, actually, which was the continuation of. Uh, and he started to identify, just by doing this, what were the areas that he needed to create systems. Now, this is more what my flowcharts look like. Um, I was working with a, another client. He runs a telco business based in Melbourne, good friend of mine, Pete. Uh, and we talked about his business and the phone call comes in. Um, the person answers the phone. They figure out what type of job it is. It gets posted on a job board. It's either a tech job or it's a something else type of job. If it's a tech job, it goes to, you know, do we need an on-site person to do it? Um, how does the invoicing work? How do we follow up bad debtors? So we just kind of went through that process and mapped it out for him. And that was a really great way to kind of identify in his business where those problems are. So what I was just going to maybe spend just a few minutes. I'd love for you to Take out a bit of paper um, and think about your own business. Think about mapping from start to end. Kind of think about, well, where does your traffic come from? Uh, think about um, uh, when they get to your website, what do they do? What's your call to action? Once uh, they make the phone call or they fill out the form or whatever, then what happens? Uh, do you send them a proposal? Do you have a chat with them on the phone? Like just visually map it out. Uh, now would be a perfect time to do that. Um, and then we'll have someone walk it through their one and we'll give them a prize. So maybe five minutes. I don't know if we've got music. If we don't have music, then um, I will sing for you. Lucky we have music. <laughs> this is an important step because it's really easy with systems and processes to not make the time to do it. Um, it's important but not urgent, so you don't get around to it. So use the opportunity for the fact that you're here in the room to just get it done now, and then we can think about delegating it later. Okay, so we'll just sort of continue on here. The, the, the takeaway here, I just want you to, as you go through this exercise, and I've done this with dog food companies, insurance brokers, healthcare professionals, a whole bunch of different industries, and um, more often than not, you can identify 10 to 15 systems that are critical, you know, mission. Um, uh, and if you get those organised, a few of the people who are sitting at tables will start to listen even more intently to what I'm saying right now. Front table, centre, middle, wearing the white. No? Okay. <laughs> the, the, um, the, that's all right. Um, the, uh, so we'll... Um, the, the real key here is to try and keep it as simple as pro possible and thinking that uh, every problem that's going on in your business really is just a problem with a system or a process. So if you say, I don't have good staff or I don't have enough leads or my sales conversion is having a problem, start to see these as just problems with your systems or, or lack of those systems. That's every problem is a systems related problem and business is simply a collection of systems. That's really the heart at, of all of the the every business is just a system or a process. So 
hopefully what I've done there is tried to help you identify where you should focus first. Because, you know, if you focus on a handful, you'll get the win and then it'll continue you on your journey. So the final thing we need to talk about here is about swiping and deploying systems and processes that are already working out there because a lot of the different problems that you've got in your business have already been solved by other people. So the... The way I learned this is through uh, the big man himself. I talked about him a little bit earlier, Michael Gerber. Um, uh, Inc. Magazine called him the world's number one small business guru expert. And uh, if you don't know him, then you, you've heard of his book. Or do we all know who he is? Yeah. Um, what I found really interesting, because I was asked to work with him late last year, his, uh, his wife... Uh, watched me do a book launch for Authority co Content, um, and she loved it. And they were about to start on a, a process of uh, all of their books previously had gone through publishers, and they wanted to do their first pub uh, self-published book. And because of that, they didn't have the marketing muscle um, that the book publishers had when it comes to getting word out. So they wanted someone to be able to help with their book launch. And his wife saw what I did with my book. Now, I don't launch books, but I'm very good at um, identifying systems and processes that are working elsewhere and piecing it together, customising it, developing it, and making it my own. Uh, and, and she saw that and she said, I want you to do that for Michael's next book. So the last book in his E-Myth series, which is called Beyond the E-Myth, um, I was involved in the launch of that. And um, last time I was here, uh, when I spoke at this event, I was just, that, I, that had just been announced. It wasn't official, um, but now we're kind of on the other side of that. Now, I learned a whole bunch of different things going through that process, as you can imagine. And it, uh, it's a long story, but I want to cut it very short so you get the key lesson. What I found super interesting is that Michael Gerber, the systems guy, everybody knows him as the systems guy, he doesn't write any systems or processes himself. Like, that's... He, he just doesn't do it. What he does is he finds the expert or the person who already knows how to do what he wants to do. He works with that person, gets them to customise that system or process for his business and then effectively gobbles up and assumes that process as part of the way that he does business. Now, part of what he does is he writes these uh, books, the Emith Vertical books. Have you seen those? Emith for plumbers, Emith for accountants, Emith for lawyers. And you'll find a co-author to co-write the book. Now, what he wanted to do is get a system so that every time his vertical books launch, he could help them become an instant Amazon success and become get bestseller status by going through this process. So that's what he was doing. He was finding the expert who already did what he wanted, worked with them, extracted it, and then I got to help Michael document that process that he'll now be offering through to his co-authors. And long story short, it was a good success. We got him to number one in the, in the paid area as well. It's a very important distinction on Amazon. There's You can become an Amazon bestseller when you give your book away for free, <laughs> or you can become an Amazon bestseller by actually selling books, and we, we got it in the bestseller category. So this germ of an idea stuck with me, and I thought, oh, that's, that's an interesting idea. So I thought... I want to start a podcast where I identify some of the biggest problems that are going on in people's business, find the expert who has already solved that, and I'd have a podcast where I would just get them to upfront state what the problem is and then go through the steps, the SOP. We would record that. Then I'd give it to my team. We'd turn that into standard operating procedures. They'd go through, listen to it, turn it into a documented SOP, and then we'd be able to run it. So the very first one that I did, because I, I wanted to do this as a podcast, I thought, well, I'm going to interview someone who has a successful podcast. I ended up doing uh, Troy Dean. I mentioned him a little bit earlier. He's got a, a successful podcast. I interviewed him. So it's a little bit meta. I, um, I was running a podcast about how to run a podcast, but I got the system and the process documented, and we documented that. And then as soon as I did that, I thought, I'm onto something. Like, this... Everybody I spoke to thought, this is an amazing idea. Like, I want to get my hands on these systems and these processes. So I started doing a whole bunch of other people. I got probably about five episodes in, and I thought to myself, I'm not going quick enough. Like, I, I, so I asked myself, how could I make this happen even quicker? How could I do it at scale? And the, the brain, it's, it's a magical thing. You ask it a question, and it goes off and figures out the answer for you. So I, I asked, how could I do it quicker? And I came up with this idea of running a virtual summit called the Business Systems Summit. And 
what I wanted to do is I broke business up into different departments, sales, marketing, finance, HR, and then I identified a handful of five, ten speakers underneath each of the different departments. And I figured out, well, what are some of the core problems that people have in each of those different departments? And then I got the speaker to present their SOP from inside their business. Uh, and then we, off the back of that, we basically documented those and turned them into SOP. So attendees of the event, they ended up getting a collection of 30 best practice systems and processes that they could you know, customise and deploy inside their business. Uh, now, you can go to the businesssystemsummit.com, pick out any of the SOPs that you want there. Like, pick a couple, uh, email me, dave at systemhub.com, uh, and I will send you whatever SOP you want and that presentation from that section. Because I, I want you to see what the output looks like. I want you to see what these documented SOPs look like. One of the, uh, one of my really favourite ones, and, and oftentimes you, you need to think in terms of what problems am I having right now, and you find the SOP that solves the problem that you're having right now. Rather than going, give me everything, narrow it in and just pick the one or two. For me, one that really resonated, um, I even gave the direct link here, you don't even need to email me for it, um, systemhub.com forward slash traction. Has anyone read the book Traction? It was by a guy called Gino Wickman. Very good book around, it's effectively, he calls it EOS, um, the Entrepreneurial Operating System, and it's, it's a management style. So how often do you uh, run meetings? How do you set your business's strategic objectives and your big rocks? And he's managed to get this process down that you could deploy in just about any business. They sold the, uh, or not, maybe licensed um, the ideas, the concepts behind traction to a guy based in Melbourne, uh, based in yeah, Melbourne or Sydney, um, Daniel Davis, and he did a presentation which basically encapsulated that. So that's a management system. So again, it depends on where you're at. If you've got a team of you know, 10 plus staff, this is an extremely useful system. Now, I'll show you something very quickly. I just want to show you uh, inside System Hub. Actually, we might, we might do that in the next session. Just to keep, keep things moving. Um, <clears throat> so at, at this point, the, the question you need to start thinking, uh, when you're growing your business and you're getting stuck between going level two and level three, um, you stop thinking about uh, how do I do this? Think about who can do this. Like, that's, that's a much better question to ask. Don't If you've got a problem, don't go, what are the steps? How do I do this? Think about who can do this for me, or who already knows how to do this? It's a much better quality question. Uh, and by going sort of that, through that process, you can identify, well, what problems are you having? Who knows how to solve them? And again, that's really what business is all about. Um, if you want, you, you might be working with an accountant already who's your an accountant. If, if you want to know, hey, I need to set regular budgets every month in my business because I don't know how to do that, you're already working with your accountant, hop on the phone and say, right, tell me, what is the process for doing a, a monthly budget? Um, can you hop on Zoom for me and talk me through the process and I'll screen record it? Or can I hop on the phone and interview you about it and capture it and then you send it off using the Upwork little trick I was talking about? That becomes part of your standard operating procedure and now you have a way for the way that you set your budgets. Um, other great ways to do it could be, you know, coming to events like these anyway, people... The other experts that are hopping up here are probably sharing systems and processes, a really effective way, because I know Steve records these and then it goes into the membership area. You could potentially take one of those videos and say, this piece here that this expert spoke about between here and here, can you extract that and turn that into some sort of process for me? Probably needs a little bit of work, but at least that gives you the guts of something to get started. Um, the question is, uh, is there any legal thing? Like, if I'm paying a, an accountant to be my accountant and I'm asking him how to document, yep, L like traction. Yeah, yeah, so you, you definitely want to customise to your situation. And I'm not talking about you going out to commercially sell these. Like, I'm not saying create a system and a process and then go and sell it. Um, if they're out there educating, saying, here's how to do something, it's learning. All you're doing is learning it, 
part of your learning is documenting it, and then you're going to end up delegating it to a team member. So it's, yeah, if you were going out selling it, yeah, that would be a problem. But, you know, you're, you're, you're using it to improve. I'm just giving you a more effective way to take the information that you learn and put it into practice as opposed to just being something that you learn. So... Um, this is the last thing. At this point, I don't know whether or not it feels like you're drinking from a fire hose at this point. You've been here for, you know, two days now and you're learning all different things about systems and I don't know if this feels a little bit like overwhelm or, hey, I'm with you, Dave. I'm following through these steps. Um, in the next session, what I want to go through is um, my methodology I call systemology and it's, it's the system for systemizing business. So step one, we've kind of already done, which is how do we map out that core business process? Step two is we need to start to think about how do we delegate that to different departments and then assign those to team members. Step three is how do we use the system for creating systems to get the team member to follow it and then you just follow through steps four, five, six and seven and it's it's a system, like it's this, the system for creating systems, a uh, system for systemizing business and this is, I haven't yet really talked about this before, this is uh, the second time I've shared, the first time I've started talking about stuff publicly at Steve's event um, and, and that's what I want to go through on the next session but the goal here, my, my goal for System Hub is we're here to free all business owners worldwide from the day-to-day -day operations of running their business. I think, I, I know a business owner can create magical things when they start to separate themselves from that day-to-day -day operations. I'm not talking about putting you on the beach for, you know, the next few years, because um, oftentimes business owners, even when they get successful, uh, it's not like they completely stop working, they keep working, but I want you working on higher quality stuff. So that's why I want to get you out of the day-to-day -day operations. And that's, that's what my goal is and what we're here to do. I want to create enough space for you to work on your business rather than in your business. Because I understand that entrepreneurs, in my opinion, and business owners, they have the biggest impact uh, in the world. Like, for me, what, what does a business owner do? They create jobs, they innovate, you know, regardless of what type of business you're in. You, what you are doing is a magical thing, and uh, it's such hard work. I take my hat off to business owners, because I know how much hard work you put in. I know the sleepless nights that you have, the hours you put in, and you're, you know, even though people are saying you're crazy, you're ridiculous, you're working these crazy hours, it's never going to work, you've got to get work, better work-life balance, but you persist through. And there is a point now, we'll try and cross that bridge and we'll start to look at business a little bit differently, but yeah, I, I, I'm here to empower business owners. So I think that's the end of this session. We'll have a little bit of a break and we'll come back afterwards. I don't know if there are any final questions or maybe we'll answer the questions during the break. That might be the easier way to do it so we can have a break. I don't know. Yeah. yeah? Well, let's give Dave a big round of applause. Thanks. So, in this uh, next session, I wanted to drill down a little bit more into this topic I call systemology, which is effectively the, the, the system for systemizing business. It's, it's the science behind this, um, something that I've been working on internally and, and just now starting to talk about more publicly um, as I further experiment with this technology and applying it to different businesses uh, this will end up evolving into a book, uh, and then that book will be the Systemologist's Handbook, most likely is the name I'm thinking about. We've got a publisher, so I might need to chat with the publisher at some point. Um, so it's, yeah, that, that's, yeah. <laughs> perfect, your marketing system is working well. Um, so the, the this is something that I've been working on, and this idea, I, I mentioned it earlier, I think once you, you start to see that everything is a system, the world around you starts to change. Everything is a system, whether it's your health, your, um, your relationships, your finance, business. It's whether you're conscious of these systems or not, or if they operate at a subconscious level, it doesn't really matter. The, the systems are running and the results that you experience in life are a direct result of these systems. So, for example, if you eat poorly and you don't exercise, um, you will, over time, end up getting overweight. Because from a, from a health perspective, that, that is an unhealthy system and it creates an unhealthy result. So everything in life, it's just a set of steps uh, that, when followed, 
provide some sort of consistent and predictable outcome. Whether you think about it or not, it's, it's happening. So the, the key is to become aware of these systems around you, identify the ones that are important to you, spend attention to focus on them, create a system and a process that you follow that deals with that, that gets you the result you're after, and then forget about it. Don't, like, just follow the system. Like, that's, that's the whole key, to create space. There's a little bit of a misconception that when you systemize things in your life, that you remove the creativity and the serendipity of life because you're turning yourself into some sort of robot that's just following checklists. But the, the reverse is actually true. What, what it does is, by getting these things into place, you don't have to think about them. And then that creates space in your mind to think about more important things. And I'll, I'll give you an example. So um, let me ask you this. I'm curious. When, when you go on holiday, uh, what's your system for deciding what you're going to pack? Like, how, how do you decide? If you're like most people, um, what they'll end up doing is they'll say, you'll just you know, have their suitcase there and they'll go, what do I need? Oh, I need some underwear. What do I need? I need some socks. What do I need? Toothbrush. And they go, what else do I need? What else do I need? What else do I need? Now, that's, that's a pretty poor system uh, because every time you kind of have to ask yourself to go through that process and you worry about whether or not you've actually remembered everything or you've, you know, have you forgotten something? Like, that's a, that's a pretty poor problem or pretty poor system. Now, if you were to document that process and have a checklist that you go through, that speeds up the process. So you just review it. Have I got this? Have I got this? Have I got this? You'll be much more efficient. You won't have to think about it. You won't be sitting at the airport second guessing going, oh, did I remember my iPod charger or did I rem remember my computer charger? Like it, it frees up your space the brain space to be thinking about more important things, like what you're going to do on your holiday, rather than thinking about, you know, what have I remembered? Just a simple process of having a checklist that you refer to when you pack. What, what does that do? That saves you five minutes here, 10 minutes, 15 minutes every time you go on holiday. Okay, so you go on holiday three, four, five times a year. Every time you go on holiday, you're saving yourself 15, 20 minutes. Over your lifetime, you might save a couple of weeks of that pain and heartache, and you'll get a better, consistent outcome by having a very simple checklist and process for the way that you go on holidays. Now, that, where the magic happens, like, that's all well and great. I just gave you a good few weeks back of your life. But where, where the, the magic happens is when you start to layer these and compound them, when you have a collection of systems and processes that save you time. Now we're talking about extreme efficiency, and, you know, the, the magic of compounding starts to happen. So it's, yeah, you, you, I think once you start to think like this, you realise how much time it ends up saving you. And there's my little checklist <laughs> for um, uh, my packing checklist. So before I came up here, I opened up my little packing checklist of things I need to do, some pre-planning the night before, things that I need to pack, uh, and I just have a little bit of a look at that, and then that makes makes sure that I, I bring everything and I don't really have to think about it. Now, I don't know what you're going to do with all of this time that I end up saving you from now that you've got this idea of systems. You might take up paragliding. You might, uh, with all of this extra time you've got, you might start scuba diving. You might start juggling with a chainsaw on a unicycle. Whatever you end up doing with your time. The, the, once you start to think more efficiently, though, in business, it frees you up to focus on more important things. And it's that, that idea. This guy, uh, Marshall Goldsmith, uh, he's a, an organisational psychologist. He said, we don't get better without structure. And that was that idea that I was trying to say before. Structure, process, uh, systems, they, they actually get you to be more creative. It's counterintuitive. You put these things in place and then it en enables you to be more creative. Why do you think someone like Mark Zuckerberg or um, Steve Jobs, they, they wear the same clothes every single day? We all know why. We've, we've heard this before. The reason that Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs wore the same thing is so that every day they wouldn't have to wake up in the morning and go, what am I going to wear today? Like they figured, well, if I've already decided that, I'm going to wear my jeans, I'm going to wear a turtleneck top or a black T-shirt, well, now 
I don't have to make that decision ever again because I'm wearing the same thing every single day. Now I can think about more important things like how can I serve my communi community better at Facebook? Like that's, that's a system that, that increases efficiency. So if you think of that and then think about how can you apply it to other areas, and we've talked about business just being a collection of systems and processes um, with the whole purpose of reducing errors, increasing efficiency, making sure you find better staff, improving your cash flow, um, it's just a step-by-step -step process. I was doing some research on systems and processes because when I go into something, I usually like to go into it quite deep. And I was going across a, um, a research report that the World Health Organization ran in 2007, and they ran this pilot on eight hospitals where they created just a 19-point checklist uh, that they got the doctors to look at every time they were about to do um, surgery. Uh, and they found when they ran it across these eight hospitals, the, the post-surgery complications, so that's things like getting infections and things like that, they dropped by one-third by simply having the checklist in place. And they almost halved the number of deaths as a result of surgery by having the checklist. That's why you've got helicopter pilots as well. When they, I mean, they helicopters and planes, they've all got checklists. That's just part of the way that they do things. And that's really what, uh, what business is about. So... I want to take you through this seven-step process, which is the, the system for systemizing business. I call it systemology. Obviously, I can't take you through everything, but I want to give you the guts of it so you've got the main pieces and the main steps that you can go through. So that the seven steps we're going to go through is first defining, and that's effectively what we did in the previous session when we talked about mapping out the flow within your business. That's step one. <clears throat> then we need to talk about allocating. How do we find the departments within your business and potentially who is going to have the responsibility of completing the documentation? We'll talk about extraction. How do we actually capture that information? What is the easiest, smoothest, most efficient, simplest way to capture it uh, and get it documented? How is that then organised in a way that the team can find it when they need it? Uh, then we'll talk about optimization. Sometimes optimization, or oftentimes optimization, will just happen by default. You don't have to get it right the first time. By going through this process and thinking, how do we do this? Just the process of asking, how do we do this, helps to optimize. Because you think, is that the most efficient way as you're doing it? Um, so that's, that's one way of optimization. There's actually a sequence of, of the stages that you go through that we'll talk briefly about. And we'll also talk about integration. I feel like this is probably the most under-serviced component or under-talked-about component in the implementation of systems and processes. Uh, I, I feel like this is where the black hole is and I think where I'm going to do my best work as far as uh, introducing this idea of systemology to the world because it's, it's the idea, how do you get your team to take this on board? If you've got an existing team and you've built up to stage number two, and they're all doing what they're doing. And you come to this idea of, yes, let's systemize our business. Uh, and, and what's Joe say? Joe goes, why do I have to change? This is the way that I've always done things. Or maybe Jane says, well, I've created this black box around me, so no one really knows what I'm doing. And that creates job security for me and low accountability. Why do I want to document this and give you visibility? So th there's a lot of resistance that happens at the integration, especially if you've got existing team members. It's much easier when you've got new team members joining you because you can just say, well, this is the way that we do things here. Much better, much easier. But it's there's a real challenge there with the integration, and that's a big reason most businesses fail when it comes to systemization. And we'll also talk about scale. Once you get this in place, the whole purpose of systemizing your business is to scale and introduce growth. And I want to give you this idea that Michael Gerber taught me where he said every business is a school. That is a really important one. If you get that, that, that can change the way that you do business. Every business is a school. All you are doing is taking people who don't know how you do what you do and you're training them. The, the whole aim of the game here for you to scale is if once you get a solid systems run business that delivers a consistent outcome that gets your clients to come back, how can you find, hire, train staff in the most efficient manner possible. 
and, and you become a training organisation. And that's really what you focus in on is training staff. So that, that, that's a big one as well. Uh, so step number one is, is around defining. And the good news is uh, we've already done step number one. You can't see the D, so it looks like one. Um, but it is done. Uh, <laughs> and um, it starts with, where do you start with defining, is identifying the mission critical systems in the business, identify um, what they are. Then once you've got those in place, the next thing I like to look at is where are the fires? So where are things where continual problems keep cropping up? I, I think of rolling out systems in terms of waves. The first wave is the mission critical stuff. The second wave is putting out fires. Uh, the, the third wave is oftentimes taking an elevated perspective of your business and identifying the missing pieces. And then you plug in those expert systems and processes that I was talking about, like finding someone else to, to, to put that system or process into place. So, so that first step, um, fortunately, we've gone through. So the next step we need to talk about is then allocation. So the way I like to explain this is through a little bit of a metaphor. If you imagine your, wor your business as the world, okay? And then if we think of your business as the world, then the countries become the departments within your business. So... There are different departments. Generally speaking, you can say, you know, sales and marketing. Some people split those two out, but every business usually has that component. Oftentimes, there's the HR component, human resources. That's the hiring, recruitment, those sorts of things. Uh, then you've got the financial side of things, which is the um, accounting, you know, BAS and bookkeeping and invoicing and chasing money and paying wages. That's your financial side of things. Uh, and then uh, you've got operations as well, and that's the actual doing of it. Now, every business is a little bit different. Some people will have other departments as well. They'll say, oh, I want an administration department, or I want a tech department, or what you need to do is just think about your business uh, in the metaphor of the globe. Think of the countries and then start to think about your, your, your different departments that make up the business. Because this, this is where you can start to assign responsibility. And that's probably the next step. Then if you think in terms of the country, if you think of it, you know, I've chunked big, your business. Now we're kind of gone down into the different departments. And then we zoom in again, and a country now is, uh, can be broken up further. So if we say this is human resources, now there are probably different systems and processes and sections that make up that department. We've got orientation and finding and hiring and managing and how do you promote and retain and fire. So you want to start to think in terms of uh, your, your business as these different departments. One thing we'll do, and, and I'll give Steve the nod to hand out a little worksheet. Um, this is probably something that you'll get to work on in your own time and you can kind of take it away. But I've got a worksheet that helps you do this. The, the process you need to go through once you get this worksheet is have a look at the flow that you've mapped out in step number one, and then you start to identify the systems and the processes that you've identified as your mission critical ones, then you need to think about, well, what are the departments within my business? And then you assign the systems to the different departments. And the reason we do this, these first couple of stages is what the business owner does. Uh, the reason the, the, the business owner or works with the team to, to do this is because for some of the later stages, you'll delegate. I, I, I first need you to understand the business as departments because that helps you then assign responsibility. And again, depending on the size of your organisation, you might be at that point where you can start to go, okay, Sally, she's our accounts lady. She now becomes responsible for this department and she's responsible for all of the different systems and processes underneath that department. I gave you a couple of little ideas on that sheet as well up the top. You can look at what your mission critical systems and processes are, but then you can also see some suggestions underneath each of the different departments. So you, you can come up with your own language as far as what you call departments. I, I, I use uh, client fulfillment there. Some people call it operations. Michael Gerber likes to call it client fulfillment. Um, there's a few different names there, but you just find what works for you, and then you start to associate the systems to the different departments. 
depending on if you're watching the recording for this and you don't have the handout, you can just go to systemhub.com forward slash decision dash tree and then you can just download that PDF. Now once, once you start to do that, then you build a real basic org chart. Now I went back through my my Dropbox, I'm a little bit of a, a pack horse when it comes to Dropbox because I have unlimited space, I will save everything. Here is one of the very first versions of an org chart that we drew. So uh, we've got our you know, CEO and then we've got the different divisions within the business. I've put names in the different divisions and then some of the divisions as well we've broken up further. So under operations, you know, the, we deliver SEO, we do websites, we do video and then there's team members underneath them. But we tried to start to get people responsible for different areas. So on that worksheet, what you want to do is then start to think about um, who is responsible for the different areas because this is part of you delegating. Again, if the systems are left up to you, they're never going to get done. The whole purpose of what I'm taking you through here is so we can delegate as quickly as possible. You know it has to be done. Let's get it off your plate and get someone else working on it. And, and that's why, as well, the idea of systems and processes um, is more relevant once you get to a certain size. Like I said, you're, once you are, uh, you've started to get a team of seven or more around you, then you've got team members that you can delegate to. If you're still in real startup mode, doing this, you're going to be you, 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 you. You're going to be in all of the different roles within your business, uh, and that's okay. But I would just keep your systems and your processes really light at that point in time, like text documents. Google Docs um, or Dropbox, uh, bullet points, uber basic, no real detail, just start to get the structure right. Think about the different departments, think about the basic systems, but don't over document. Um, but depending on where you're at, like I said, the, the right message for the right time, if your business is at the right size and you go through this process, um, it'll be that game changer for you. The next thing we have to do after that is the extraction. So how then, now that we know who is going to actually capture these or who's responsible for them, how do we actually get it out of their head in the most efficient manner? And that's, we talked about the system for creating systems, so make sure that you grab a copy of that template. Um, I, I've got a real basic version of it just here. Um, I have, I've stripped out all of the, the basics. You can see here that's version one because that's kind of with no sub points. The, <coughs> the version that you'll download is actually this version up here and it's got all of the bullet points to explain them. But it's you, step one, identify the result that you're looking for for that system to create. Step number two, identify who is going to best uh, document that within your business. Step three, figure out, figure out the method of capture. Like I said, it's, it's usually best to capture someone as they're doing it. Uh, so that might be screen recording, video, audio. If, ideally, if you just get them while they're doing it, that's, that's best. Uh, you record the task being done. You then upload that video somewhere, preferably into System Hub. Uh, then you use the system for creating systems. You delegate the documentation component to someone else. You, you, you know, your Philippines-based assistant or you, if you've got an admin girl that's sitting up the front um, who, who doesn't have enough to fill her day, she could be perfect for that role. Um, you create the documentation around it. Then next time the task is done, it goes back to the person who they extracted the steps from and they follow it next time or they have it handy just to make sure that they feel like all of the steps are there and they, they fill it out, because even with staff, like you have to make this as easy for staff as possible. Because that's why I think the initial documentation, if you can get someone else to do it, it makes it so much easier. How much easier is it for you to look at a document and edit it than it is to start from scratch? You assign this and delegate it to a team member and say, it's your responsibility to do this. I'm going to check back in with you in one week's time, and I want to make sure that you've done these 10 processes oh, I was so busy, the phone was ringing on Thursday, I had too many emails, this cropped up, that cropped up. Um, much easier if you, you get them something to edit because then they're almost compelled, well, I don't want it to be wrong. So it's much easier to edit than it is to start from um, scratch. Then you would submit it for some sort of review. Now, always within your business, uh, you want to have two people who can do a task. You've got the primary person and you have to have a secondary person. 
Uh, so that way you've got the redundancy. If someone goes on holiday, they're sick, whatever, um, you've got that backup there. So the, the primary person teaches the secondary person. More often than not, the best time to test your system is by teaching someone else once it's documented. Or when you get a new staff member, they're the best. Get a brand new staff member, start showing them the systems and the processes, and watch where they ask the questions. That's where you have to do the systems improvement because it's not necessarily clear for them. And then, yeah, you, you just want to encourage the use of systems. And once you take on this systems thinking as the business owner, you always need to go back to your staff. Oh, where's the system for that? Have you got that documented? Oh, can you send that through to me? Um, I love to tweak the system. Uh, I, I, don't, um, I don't give feedback to staff as much now. Like Melissa, who runs Melbourne SEO and Video now, I used to be a little bit of a, I'm a reformed micromanager, um, and I used to love to jump in and say, oh, you should have done things this way or that way or whatever. Um, and she said, no, 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 the way that we need to do it is channel it back into the system. So I go in and I find the appropriate system. If I want to tweak an email template, I tweak it right in the system, so that way next time it's done correctly. Or I find out who the system owner is and I give them the feedback. I don't go to the person who's executed the task and say, oh, you did this or that wrong. It's, it's always about improving the systems. So this uh, process, it's, it's easy. Um, I shared this idea with David Warren. That was the guy uh, Tim Reed introduced me to, uh, based out of the, the Philippines, who runs the BPO, used to run the tall ships company. Uh, and as soon as he heard this process, he's like, oh, I want you to do this for me. I want you to sit down and guide my team through it, because he's obviously got his Philippines-based team. So he assigned two staff members to work on this process over the course of three to six months, and I worked with them to document their processes and their procedures, just under some guidance. Uh, and now I can't take credit. Well, like Dave's a very smart guy, and he's, he's great operator and grows business, but the growth that he has seen, I can say without a doubt, and he would agree that without this documentation, he would not have been able to grow at the level he has without this in place. Like, it's critical. So it's going through this process, we'll get the result. Um, then we need to talk about, well, how do we actually organise this? Once it's captured, where does it get organised? <clears throat> now, there's, there's two ways to do this. You can do it the easy way, or you can, can do it the hard way. The, the, the lessons here around systems and processes is that it has to be central. It has to be cloud-based. Everybody has to be able to jump in and grab it when they need it. Um, it needs to be easy. Um, you, you don't want anything with feature bloat. You don't want anything that overcomplicates things. In fact, uh, too many features is actually it's the enemy of systemization. You also want to avoid mixing project management with software, uh, sorry, project management with document management. Some people try and get their systems documentation software to also assign out who's doing what by when. So they'll inside they'll have a system and then they'll say, you should be doing this then. But oftentimes if, if a tool tries to do both documentation um, management and project management at the same time, they actually do uh, neither very well. You'll, you'll see the difference between a project management tool is like Asana, um, Basecamp, Trello, Teamwork PM, like there's tons of them. Podio, do any of these names sound familiar? What do people use? What's the recommended uh, teamwork? Teamwork, like that, the, what is the purpose of teamwork software? It is to identify who does what by when so there's some accountability. Yes, you can use email to do that, it just does a really, really bad job of it. That's why people use project management tools. And it's the same with systems documentation tools. The system and documentation tool is about the how-to. How is it done? So in your teamwork, you might say, here are the five steps and here are the people that have to do it. And you assign it to them and have a due date. But if they don't know how to do it, you have to then link to some training that explains how to do that particular step. Project management tool is not the right place to store that. Soft, like documentation management is. Um, we used to try and use Dropbox. I tried to use Google Sites. I tried different wiki programs. A lot of them had a lot of different problems. The biggest thing, really, it's they weren't intuitive. And if there's friction in capturing systems, you lose. The team won't do it. You have to make it so simple that anybody can run with it. So we ended up... Um, I was doing a little bit of work with uh, Jim's, <clears throat> the Jim's group, 
And I asked them, what, what do you use for documentation management? I said, oh, we use Dropbox. And I said, oh, t tell me a little bit about that. What, what? Them, they are the poster child when it comes to systems and processes. I mean, they're a franchising company with so many different divisions and they use Dropbox. And I said, oh, the problems we have with Dropbox. Um, we, we have our folder that is sunk across all of our different um, contractors or the, the, the franchisee holders. Uh, and we had this uh, one time when someone accidentally uploaded inappropriate material into the Dropbox, and I think you can read between the lines as to what that inappropriate material might have been, and then it sunk across everybody's account. So everybody had it starting appear in their account. They had other situations where someone accidentally deleted a folder, and then it disappeared everywhere for everyone. So the, I found it, yeah, for me, that was like, well, we, we were having some similar problems, and we were seeing the same with Google Sites. So that's why we ended up developing our own software solution. That's what System Hub is. Um, took me four years to develop. Spent a good few hundred thousand dollars on getting it developed. I'll show you briefly about it, but here's a nice little video that um, uh, my video guy made. S so this particular platform, and there's just a screenshot there. If we've got a little bit of time at the end, I'll kind of jump in, but it, that kind of gives you an idea. It's, I mean, if you know how to use Windows, uh, if you know how to use Finder, um, then you know how to use System Hub. It's folder-based structure. It's um, cloud-based, easy to use. You can get quite tight with your control around sharing and permissions. Um, it's got the ability to print uh, like a, a set of processes based on department. So let's say you've got a new marketing assistant there starting or maybe you've got a retail store and you, you need a manual for, for how you do operations at head office or answer the phone or whatever. You could print out manuals based on a department or you can just run it straight from the cloud. And that's probably a little bit outside of the scope of what we'll go into now, but that's, yeah, the way that we've done it. I'm extremely proud of what we've done. Uh, and I, I think it's a little bit of a game changer. I, I will show you a little bit towards the end. We'll just kind of see if we've got a little bit of time. But I showed this guy here, uh, Brian Keane, what we were doing. Uh, he runs a company called Franchise Simply. Uh, he helps businesses franchise. And as soon as he saw this, he said, every franchise needs this. I mean, that's at the heart of franchising. It, it is systems. That's effectively what you're selling when you're selling a franchise. So um, they've taken that on board. And then now we're working with some really interesting companies, everything from a, <clears throat> a company that hires out mobile abseiling walls to um, yoga studios to companies that help grind rock floors to a cleaning company. Like we've started to apply this into a whole bunch of different verticals and getting some, some really great results. So uh, the, the purpose I... I say that is just, again, to squash that monster in your head that says, yeah, but I'm different. You know, I, I work online. I work offline. I work in Australia. I work in Africa. I, I, my job is too creative. My job is not creative enough. My, like, you, if you're looking for an excuse, you'll find them. Like, there's plenty of different excuses, um, but they are just excuses. You will have to cross this bridge at some point, fact, if, if you want to grow. So then we kind of move into, we're into the, the final run now. We're around uh, optimization. So the way to optimize, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, optimization will happen by default. So just by capturing the way that you're doing what you're doing, we'll get the team to ask, is that the most efficient manner? Then beyond that, once you start to see business as a collection of systems, you can start to look at things from an elevated perspective. And you'll start to see when you do the flow charting exercise, you'll start to see where you are deficient in your business. Because quite often, when a business owner starts a business, they're usually strong in a couple of different things. Maybe they're the technician, or maybe they're very good at marketing. Like usually, they are good at one or two things, uh, but they often forget that business has all of these different divisions. Maybe their finance is shot. Maybe they're very bad with their HR, so they keep on having staffing issues. Uh, and it's, it's because they're not seeing their business as a whole and, and recognising the different departments. So once, once you flowchart out your entire business and then you can start to see where you're missing things, then uh, you can 
check, well, you can go to the, the Business System Summit and you identify what, where you're struggling or you jump into uh, the academy and you, you have a look at, well, what are some of the recordings from the past session? Okay, I'm having trouble, trouble with sales. Well, where can I go and find a, a system or a process on sales that I, we can document and then implement into the business? Um, so that's, yeah, that elevated perspective. The other... Um, other way that optimization happens, and these are just the first couple of levels, is through management or measurement. Um, and measurement is about using the project management tool I was talking about. If you, if you map out a process or a procedure, you assign it to a different person, then you use project management tool to make sure the tasks are getting done. Just by watching where things are breaking down, you can optimize that way. Like, if you follow those three steps, you'll get really good wins. Yes, there are ways to speed this up. Yes, you can be more efficient if you've got money to throw at this and if you're a bigger company and you've lagged in getting systems in place, then you, you can hire the consultant. They can come in and architect the perfect system or process to solve that problem that you've got that's tailored to you and then the rest of your team can follow it. But these three steps work very well for someone if they're just getting started out and they're still, you know, trying to bootstrap this and keep it as tight as they can. But project management is um, one of those tools that, that I'll show you a little bit maybe in our Asana tool um, how, how we use it. Um, that's probably a good way to do it. Uh, okay, let me do that. I'm going to jump over to Asana. And <clears throat> the way that we think about our business, uh, if you can see that, okay, um, these are templates. These are all of the different products and services that we sell, you know, infographics, videos, uh, website builds. Um, <clears throat> and these are just uh, templates here. Uh, there's a system over in System Hub over to the master template. Oh, bad internet, but there we go. Um, we'll have a look at that system in a second. But there's the overall system that explains how this is done, then underneath that, then we've got all of the main core steps in the process. So it's, it's, uh, we could then, let's say, you know, someone, we would duplicate this, a client comes on board and says, I want to buy a website from you. So we would set up a project in Asana, we would duplicate this task or this set of tasks into their uh, little project inside Asana. And then we'd have a project manager oversee this, and they would come in here and assign. They'd go, okay, well, step one, number one is done by Melissa. Okay. And that is due on, you know, next Wednesday. So then she would go through and then do that. And then it would be a case of going through all of the different steps. Now, underneath a lot of these steps, we have then the system or the process. If the person doesn't know how to do that step, then there is a well-documented system uh, or process inside uh, System Hub that shows how to do that, that task. Now, this is the overall one, so it's a, it's a little bit <laughs> epic. Um, but then we have, you know, supporting videos, and then there's email templates. So one of the first steps is we make a sale. Uh, the salesperson has to do a handover to the accounts person. And here's the email template that they would do for the handover. You know, great to chat with you earlier. I'm going to CC in blah, blah, blah from accounts. I need this information to get you invoiced. Here's the cost. And, you know, here are the next steps. They would come in here. They'd copy that, go over to Gmail, customize that email, and then they'd send, send that off. So we, we have in here the whole process for the way that we deliver um, from, yeah, the handover, and then what happens after that? Okay, the accounts team, what do we say? I've not created all of these systems, but I can read them. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so then we need to prepare the initial invoice. Once the invoice has been created, then we create a new workspace in Asana. Um, then we need to duplicate the tasks in the workspace. That's what I was telling you. Um, okay, they set up a Dropbox folder. Uh, accounts... They tick off that they've done the subtasks, and there's a mother thread that the project manager takes over. So it's just to give you a bit of an idea, and we've done this for all of our different products and services that we sell. Like if I go back to here, you know, um, let's make sure I'm looking at the right one. No, might have drilled in. Uh, I've changed the wrong screen. Oh no, there we go. Melbourne, okay, so this is a, 
This is a video package. So if someone buys a video package from us, again, an overall system that explains how it's done, uh, the steps from discovery call. So if you imagine systemizing your business down to this level, this is how things get done to a certain standard without me involved now. Like we've got it to a point where we can sell things and I'll hop into Asana and I'll see projects over on the side here uh, and I'll have no idea who some of these names are for the clients. Like because I wasn't involved in the sale and then the delivery as well. So anyway. Uh, we've created the templates. I'm, I'm not familiar with the free version that much. That, that is a paid version of Asana, but it's just templates. Team, team work, teamwork will do the same. All project management tools, they'll have master templates that you can set up, uh, and then you just duplicate it, and then you link it together with a how-to. But that's how your project management tool and your systems documentation tool work together to create a really great result. Um, helpful? That, this one's called Asana. Um, Podio, Teamwork, that's the one. Um, Basecamp, Trello. Uh, try not to get too caught up in what the software is, as long as you've got something in place that solves that problem. It's, it's not, not about the software. The only piece of software that you need is System Hub. <laughs> the, um, so we're up to integration now, which is we're into the final run now. Uh, and we talked about some of the problems, like why do people fail when they try and integrate this into their business? Um, I can't go through everything, but there's a few key ones. Uh, and, and I want to give you the high level so you can understand it. I mean, it needs to start with the business owner. You have to have the breakthrough to go systems thinking is the way forward. Um, you will need to, at some point, get a systems champion to sit side by side with you in the business at some point, because you're the worst person to do the documentation. Um, but then you also need to get the team on as early as possible into this process. They need to be involved with this, especially if you've got an existing team. And if you've got an existing team, there are different resistances. The, the, the way to overcome the resistance is to understand what's in it for them. Like, why, why the, has the person, or why would a staff member want to document their systems and their processes? Are you going to get me to document my systems and processes and then shift my job offshore to an emerging economy where someone can do my job for $10 an hour? Well, that's a little bit risky. Maybe I'm going to do a real crap job at documenting this process so you have a poor experience over there offshoring and then you go, that doesn't work, I might as well keep everything local. Like, you, you have to think, well, why? What is it in it for the person to do the documentation? So firstly, you need to get the team, everybody, at least your leadership team, involved as early as possible to understand, hey, we've reached this plateau, we're stuck here. For us to break through, we have to do the systemization. What is the benefit for them? If, if we document this, this enables you to move up in the ranks. Now you become a department head who oversees a larger team beneath you. You're more valuable to me at this point in time. I can afford to pay you more now because you're a, a leader. Like, uh, you're creating opportunity by, by getting them to delegate work to lower cost resources, that frees them up to work on higher value tasks. It's actually in their best interest to document that because it creates the opportunity. Now, in our business, um, that, you know, there's the misconception that working with offshore steals jobs from Australian staff. Like, sometimes that will pop up. Uh, and... The misconception there for us is business is hard enough, right? You, you don't have a margin for error. Labor costs are so expensive in Australia. Uh, what ends up happening is if you move some of those tasks offshore, it creates a little bit of extra margin for you as a business owner, a little bit of extra breathing room. As you grow, that means you can actually hire more local staff. By me offshoring, we've actually ended up hiring more because we, we're growing, and it's, it's ended up being a real good thing. I mean, half of our staff is located locally, and we have half offshore. And, and it's, it's been, yeah, so you need to help them to understand that what we're trying to do here <clears throat> is grow the business 
improve that efficiency. Um, the other thing it does is it enables them to go on holidays. <clears throat> a lot of team members think if I go away on a holiday, there's pressure on them because they're key person dependent. The business, they're the only person who knows how to do the invoices or you know follow up this or that. So for them, uh, it's hard for them to take a break because you as the business owner don't want them to go. And then when they come back, they've got an inbox that's 300 emails deep that they then spend the next six months trying to catch up on. Like that, that's pain. Whereas if you can help them to understand, but if we document this and you have someone side saddling you, this means you can go ahead, take some time off. Got stuff going on in the family? No worries. Go address that and then come back and the, the business doesn't fall in a heap. It's all about the system. So you need to help them to understand that. The other thing is, again, it's, it's keeping it simple. <coughs> Kiss, <laughs> if you didn't get the connection. Um, don't over-document things. Make sure that you um, use, a very, use something like System Hub where it's easy and intuitive to learn. Uh, only document things that are a core. Start with that and get everybody involved in the process. Also, have a B1 and a B2, have a primary person who owns the system and have a secondary person who owns the system as well, um, or at least backs that person up. So the primary person teaches the other person how it's done, so that way they can take leave and go on holiday. So you want to have a, a B1 and a B2, avoid that single person dependency. <clears throat> the other thing uh, as well... Uh, to, that's all well and good if you've got existing staff. That, what I took you through there is about how you overcome some of the challenges for your existing staff. If it's brand new staff, it's so much easier. It's just, here's the way that we do things here. And you educate them right up front. You create an onboarding sequence. This is the way that we've done it uh, inside Asana. <clears throat> I'll just go into... There's my cursor... So this is inside our Asana again. Every team member, when they come on board, we duplicate this, and this is our onboarding sequence for them. So they come in here, and they watch a welcome video. They go, here's the training on how to use Asana. Here's the training on how to use um, Dropbox, how to use Skype. We introduce our core values. We are a systems-run organization. That is one of our core values. Um, policies, guidelines. So we have a structured onboarding process that everybody goes through, and then that is just the way that we do what we do. Like That's a, a fantastic way to um, have someone... And, and if it goes back to that idea, I told you before, every business is a school. So that is my learning program for the way that people start. means I can get them trained up to a certain level very quickly without any input from me, and it's done consistently. And everybody goes through that same training. So there's no, oh, you weren't taught how to do that. You didn't know that. You didn't know you should be... If you've gone through and you've checked off the items, you have accepted that I've gone through this training. And then if you don't follow it, it's so much easier for me from a management point of view to then go back and say, why didn't you do this? It's in the system. If it's not in the system and they didn't do something, then I just fix the system. So next time, it doesn't happen again. So the best way to manage team members is by managing the system. Because if they haven't followed the system, well, that's a whole other issue. The issue is that you haven't followed the process. But if they followed the process and then they made a mistake, that's okay. That's just learning. That's enabled us to tighten up and improve the system. If you're having trouble with this, um, we're training up certified systemologists that will go in and work with businesses to help them with this component. It's quite possibly one of the hardest components and where most businesses fall. You'll come down to a seminar like this, you'll get all excited by systems and processes, you'll go back and introduce it to your team, and then you'll go, reality kind of sets in. So if you need help, that's something we can help with. And then the final piece in the last few minutes I've got is, uh, we'll talk about scale. How do we scale from here? We talked about uh, th there's quite a few points under here. I've picked out the top three, uh, but every business is a school. That's If you approach scale like that, you are in the training organisation business. So you need a way... The, the things that you need to, to have in place to scale is, one, you need a way that you can find staff quickly and hire them, find the right people, good people. Then you need a way that you can train and onboard them and then you need a way that can manage them, like a management system. Now, I gave you the management system a little bit earlier. That's what that whole traction piece was about. Um, the 
uh, recruitment system. I use a, a thing I developed called the George Foreman method. Uh, the reason I call it the George Foreman method is because you give your staff a good grilling. <laughs> um, but it, it, the, the process, um, you know, the short version of the process is you get clear on who you need to hire, you write the job ad, you post uh, the, the job ad, you start off by getting them to fill out a questionnaire like, that should be the first engagement piece. Don't have them send you a CV or cover letter. Get them to fill out a 20-minute questionnaire um, detailing all of the things that are important about uh, that role, why they think they're qualified, what their wage expectations are. Just, just by putting that piece in place, someone who isn't willing to go through a 20-minute questionnaire to apply for a job that they think they're well-suited for, that will weed out so many different people. The A player will stick with it and go the whole way through. Then the next step after that is you give them a simple task. So they make it through the questionnaire. Think of it like a funnel. You tip as many people into the, front as the funnel as you can, as many people to see the ad as possible. Then only a small selection of those will fill out the questionnaire. Then you give them a trial task. Only a small selection of those people will do the trial task. Of those, you can filter it down even further anyway because some people are going to do a real bad job at the trial task. Um, then at that point, you might ask for a cover letter and a CV. Now you're only looking at a handful rather than hundreds. Uh, and then you make your final uh, decision to interview. So now you're probably only interviewing a handful of people. We've just filtered down, like, down to gold down here. And at this point, if you're still struggling, if you've got two or three candidates that are very suitable candidates, then you might trial them for the role. Give them another trial task, get two people working on it for a week and say you're part of a trial. And that's how you find good staff. Um, yeah, you want to make sure that your business is a training organisation. We, we talked about that. Um, and I talked about traction. That is the management component. And, and once you start to do this, you, you build your system and your business like a machine, a finely oiled machine. That's the aim of the game. I worked with these guys, uh, Mike and Amy Hamilton. They run uh, uh, an agency out of the US, been working with them for three years. Uh, they focus on the chiropractic niche. And we've built up this system and it's grown. their business has grown exponentially now. And they're at a point now where they're looking to license uh, their systems and processes into different countries. So that... because. What they have now is the, the IP of how that business is run and very scalable. That's where the money is. Once you get to that level, that's the complete entrepreneur. You're selling your IP there. You're selling business opportunities. You're selling the systems. Like, that's, that's that final stage. So there we go. That's systemology. First time I've talked about it. Hopefully, parts of it resonated with you. You can use it as a bit of a roadmap. I appreciate you being part of that journey. This will turn into a book at some point in time. It's a roadmap and a blueprint. We've proven it works. The next step for me, just like I did when I launched Authority Content, is I have to collect <clears throat> as much proof as possible. Like for me, the best way to sell something is to have undeniable proof. So when I launched Authority Content, we, I got a whole bunch of people to review the book, you know, as many high profile, low profile, everything in between, real world people, and I got them to test the system and then come back to me and give feedback and I collected that feedback and that was kind of like my launching pad to then come out with the book and go, I know this works. So this is a brand new process for me. I'm looking for people who I can work with to uh, deploy systemology, make sure it works, make sure that you're a case study. If you're interested, I'm running a coaching program that'll go for two months, uh, which takes you deep into this with the ability to delegate it to your team. Uh, Obviously, if you want to find out more about that, you can do it. It's starting at the start of September. Um, if hopefully something that I've done here today really inspired you about systems, that's what I was here to do. I just wanted to get you to go, yeah, I can see systems are the way. Systems are the way forward. I hope that, you know, I, I put that... That, that ripple, I think I I've, I've hope I've started something. You don't know where it'll go now. Like, this is the start. That ripple, once you become, you see the world through systems, it just changes the way that you think about systems. I like a good story, so I'll just finish with a story, and then I'm done. The last thing, I want to tell you about the very first system that I ever saw. <clears throat> I have to take you back, though, 1988. Um, I was only seven at the time. Uh, my dad created the first system I ever saw called the Sheet. <clears throat> and it was a points-based system. 
that we, uh, my brother and I, uh, I'm Dave, my brother was Chris, it was a points-based system <clears throat> for what my dad believed was how to live a good life. Uh, and he, he associated all of the different actions to having a good life uh, and connected them with points. So um, I could brush my teeth and I'd earn a few points. I could wash dad's car, I'd earn a few more points. Uh, I would go to bed at a certain time, I'd earn more points. Now, <clears throat> remember I was seven. My dad was a little bit funny, I think. I could still go to bed on a Friday night as a seven-year-old at 10.15 p.m. What was he thinking? <clears throat> and I'd still earn two points. Um, but it was, it was really interesting insight uh, into what he saw his value set and what he was trying to imprint onto my brother and I. Uh, there were some other <clears throat> ones as well. So these points would get tallied up at the end of the week. And there was a scoring system down the bottom here. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you would, he would add up all of those points and then that would equal pocket money. Now, in 1988, as a uh, seven-year-old, $7 per week was actually pretty good pocket money. And I am... Uh, I understood the rules of the game, and I played the game very, very well, to the point where I was maxing out every single week, and I was also earning, because I had over 300 points for five weeks running, I'd also get my bonuses as well. It got to a point where Dad had to change the rules of the game because he was paying out too much. Now, I understood the rules of the game. I learnt the game. I played the game incredibly well. My brother, on the other hand, he hated the sheet. He loathed the idea of the sheet and how we were getting played. He didn't want to take part in the sheet. He didn't give a sheet. He, he, he just... He, he, and it's, it's funny. I, I, I see this even in business. You can, you can have a great system and a process... But you have, the person has to get buy-in. You have to get buy-in from the team. They have to follow it. No matter how good your system is, you have to follow it to get the great result. So that's why we need to try and make it as easy and simple as possible. There's a photo of my dad, and that was Nathaniel as he grew up a little bit older. I know you saw him a bit earlier. And that pretty much brings us to a close. So thank you. Well done, Dave. That was excellent. I thought what a great way to finish our uh, two-day boot camp on systems and automation with Dave Jennings. He's very, very passionate about systems and basically you've built your whole life around it, haven't you, now moving forward. It's, uh, yeah. So uh, any questions for Dave before we go? Okay, Heather. Yep. Of course. A friend of Steve is a friend well, of mine. Just email me and I, I'll... Figure out something that gets you in at the best rate for life. Dave at systemhub.com. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. And it is good. We, we don't use it yet. Yep. But we've certainly had a look around it as one of the, the early people to, um, to check it out. And it is, looks very, very good. Yep. Uh, Dave. It's Dave. Yep. Yeah. But you can call me David. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it is Dave. <laughs> um, oh, just a, something I noticed then from the scorecard, from the sheet. Yeah. It's interesting, though, as business owners, because there was an incentive there for you, you figured out the game and you knew you had to do a certain number of things to get a result. So it's funny, as business owners, if we put the systems in place, for example, we will get a result, correct? Yes. Right. But so it's intangible at the moment. We yeah. can't actually see it. A couple of things, real key insights there. That's another reason why... Uh, the adoption of systems for a lot of people is hard because the result or the benefit that you get is not immediately felt. And it's a compounding effect. So you have to do it over a period of time. And you also have to make sure that you incentivize the right thing. Otherwise, people find out how to game the system. So you need to get very clear on what the KPI is and what the measurement is and reward the right behavior. So it's not, not always gross. You know, maybe it's net. Like There's lots of different examples. Yeah. But for instance, if there was a $7,000 reward, if you implemented 10 systems into your business in the next five weeks, yep. how many people would do it? If it was $70,000 cash from David Jennings. I was going to say from Steve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> would you do it? Would the incentive be there? For seventy thousand dollars, yeah, you'd do it. But maybe. perhaps the suggestion yeah. is that I need to if, run a prize draw. Well, <laughs> maybe. maybe if somebody put ten systems yeah. in their business, the return is going to be greater than seventy thousand dollars. Yep. So you almost have to trick your brain into thinking, you know, you, if you can see something tangible, you're more inclined to do it. But just knowing, mm. and you've got to believe in yourself that you will get the positive outcome if you go and implement ten systems into your business in the next seven weeks. And if if you think about it, like. I don't think you can argue a case for the fact that you wouldn't get a result. Like, it is the fundamental. All we're talking about is finding a consistent pro approach to deliver a consistent outcome. Yeah. Like, you can't argue that fact. Like, that's what it is. Yeah. So, you, you, assuming you're getting the right steps and the, you've got the right systems in place, you will get a better result. Yeah, I think the analogy we used, and you used it earlier, was that if you eat the right... If you want to lose weight and you get fitter, Yep. If you consistently for seven weeks eat the right food, exercise five times out of seven, five out of seven days, if you do that consistently for seven weeks, you will get a result. There is just no other way that you will not get the result or closer to the result that you want. Same with you know, creating systems. Agreed. Excellent. Anyway, I'm just confirming what you've already said. <laughs> anyway, it's been a wonderful pleasure to have you come up, Dave. Yeah, it was a you. massive effort. Um, Six-week-old bub at home. First time that David's left his wife at home with the two kids. So uh, She said the last. <laughs> the, the last as well. So uh, you won't see him again. So uh, take a photo with him because that'll be the last time you see him. That's right. Awesome. Thank you, David. Excellent. Thank you.